Well, hello, Central family. Special shout out to anyone watching from St. Greg's. Special shout out to anyone watching from our Creston campus. And of course, anyone who's watching from any other locations uh, around here as well. My name is Chelsea Jasky. I am the youth director here at Central. And gosh, it's just awesome to be able to be here and just to share a message with you this morning. So we're going to just go ahead and dive right in. I do want to warn you, we're going to be jumping around quite a bit this morning, but I promise you I'll try to do my best to kind of tie a nice little bow around it. We'll have the scriptures up on the screen for you to follow. You can even follow along in our app as well, um, but I'll also read them out loud too. So however you want to follow along is just fine with me. So today, we're going to be looking at a question that I think if any of you have ever taken a breath on this earth, which is all of us, we've probably asked this question at one point in our life. And the question is this, it's that, what is my purpose? What's my reason for being here? Why am I here on this planet? What is my purpose? What's the point of life in general? Why am I here? And you know, the church world, we like to not use this term in this way. We don't like to say, you know, what's my purpose? Instead, we kind of like to dress it up and we like to make it seem, you know, really fancy and elusive. And so we use words like, well, what's my calling? Or what's God's will for my life? And while there's absolutely nothing wrong with these terms, in fact, they're biblical and we'll talk about that today. What I do have a problem with a little bit is that when we talk about this idea of our purpose or our calling or God's will for our life, a lot of times the message that surrounds it tends to be this, this elusive goal. It tends to be like we talk about our calling as like this, this elite club that you have to be a part of. You're either walking in your calling or you're not walking in your calling. You're either walking in your purpose or you're going through life trying to figure out what your purpose is. And so for a long time, this idea of a calling frustrated me. And I think we're all familiar with the movie, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, right? Where, you know, Willy Wonka puts out these golden tickets and there's only a few golden tickets. And these kids try to find these golden tickets and once you find your golden ticket, you're in the club, you get in the chocolate factory. And I think sometimes I thought about my calling as this golden ticket of an idea where God just places this golden ticket with my name on it and it's up to me to go through life figuring out, okay, what is my calling? What am I meant to do here? Where is my golden ticket? And a few problems with this are one is that it becomes really daunting. When we think we have just one golden calling in our life, it becomes so overwhelming. And you know, I grew up in the church world, and so, you know, I believe in God and his promises and his good plan for our lives, but I have to take a step back and think about those of you out there who maybe aren't Christians, who look at this idea and think, well, if God has one calling for my life and it's up to me to figure out what that is, why would I even try to do that in the first place? I'm being set up for failure. The second problem, too, that I have with this one idea of this one calling that we're trying to go after in our life is that it then becomes that every decision that we make becomes a critical decision. We're either making a decision that's walking in line with our calling and our purpose, or the decisions that we make are walking against our calling and our purpose. And when we make a mistake, because the fact of the matter is, it's not a matter of if we make a mistake, it's a matter of when we make a mistake, we think, well, geez, I'm off course, so there's no point in just trying again. We look at our past and we see all the mistakes piled on top of each other and we think, well, I am so far off this God plan purpose thing that why would I even try? What's the point? And then, as if those things aren't bad enough, all we have to do is look to our left and look to our right and see the pain and the heartache and the hard things going on in this world and we think, what? If there really is a good God with a good plan and these people living out these good golden ticket callings, why do we experience so much suffering? How in the world can this be it? What's the point? There's this thing going around the internet, well, it's been going around for a long time, that has a hashtag to it and everything, but it's this concept of expectation versus reality. 
So these things where these people uh, share photos or stories of when they expected something, but then reality strikes and there's a completely different outcome. Um, and one of these ideas is uh, what I ordered versus what I got. So people that ordered something and then what they received was completely different than what they expected to get. So I have a few photos to kind of help example this idea. Um, but the first one is that there's a gentleman who decided he needed a rug, yep. And so he orders, like all of us would, on Amazon, this rug. And what he got in the mail was a little bit different than what he expected, because he expected a full-size rug, and yet he got this tiny little miniature thing. <laughs> the second picture that I have is a woman who, you know, it was her friend's birthday, and her friend's name is Ashley, and her friend's name is spelled A-S-H-L-E-E. -E. So she clarifies for the baker who's making the cake, spell Ashley with two E's. Well, <laughs> happy birthday, Ashley, spelled with two E's. <laughs> I can just imagine her when she picks up the cake thinking, wait a second, what? This isn't what I expected. The last one, you know, a lot of women, we look, when we're looking for wedding dresses, we look online because they're cheaper, there's a big variety. Well, woman finds a beautiful wedding dress, orders it online, finds out it's a little or completely different than what she expected. And while these are cute and funny examples, and I think we all kind of have our own stories of things that maybe we ordered or we had expectations for something and they didn't turn out the way we expected, I think about how this kind of, well, does have to do with our life and how a lot of us, we go through life with expectations. We sign up for this American dream. We go to school, we graduate from school, we find the girl, we marry the girl, we get the job, we get the promotion, we have the kids, we send the kids off to school, and along the way we have these grand expectations, but then life happens. Heartache happens, pain happens, mistakes happen, change of plans happen, and we look back and we think, wait a second, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I ordered. And so we conclude, we think the title of my sermon today is this, what's the point? If I am going through life expecting these things and they're having completely different outcomes and there's this golden calling with my name on it that I can't find, what's the point? And so this morning, we're going to try to tackle an answer to that question and we're going to, of course, look at what Scripture says about it and you might think that the answers that I give you to answer this question of what's the point, what's our purpose, is a cop-out. Because the answers will seem familiar, they'll seem common, they'll seem too easy. But I promise you that it's, if we want to live a truly fulfilled and purposeful life on this planet while we're here, we have to understand these truths. They are foundational if we want to live out our calling. And so I want to first turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And, and we're going to read 17 through 20, and I want you to pay attention to this part of Scripture. We're going to talk about two purposes, God's purpose and our purpose. So starting in verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Now I want to stop for a second because this is the first part of talking about our purpose, is we have to understand what God's part is in all of this. And Paul tells us not once but twice in this passage what God's purpose is. He says, God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. He repeats it again, reconciling to the, the world, to himself in Christ. God's purpose is to restore our relationship with him. We were meant and put on this planet to have open communication with him, to have a relationship with him. But when sin entered the world, that relationship was completely severed. That bridge was broken. And his purpose was to restore that relationship to restore that bridge so that we could have an open relationship with him again. 
And he did that. He restored that relationship through his son, Jesus. Through sending his son to die on the cross and take our sins for us. And it's through that act and through that purpose that we can, again, have a relationship with him. And the best news of all is that God's purpose is already done. It's a one and done deal. We don't have to do anything more. He doesn't have to do anything more. That purpose has already been fulfilled. And once we understand what God's purpose is, then we can really look at, okay, what's our purpose in this life? And Paul continues. He gives us hints and clues as to what our purpose is. Continuing in verse 19, it says, And then he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Our purpose, our calling, is to simply receive and embrace that message of reconciliation. God already did the hard work of reconciling us to him. All we have to do is receive and embrace that message and be in relationship with him. We are messengers of that. We are ambassadors, Paul says. Simply receive and embrace that message of love. So the first point that I want to make this morning is this, is that your purpose on this planet, your purpose, your calling is about your relationship, not your resume. You know, you see, we confuse calling with all the things that we do, right? We confuse our calling with all the actions. It's our ambitions and our desires. It's our positions in our companies. It's our acquisitions. It's the things that we, we get and receive on a daily basis. And so we chase this grind and we hustle and we grind. And at the end of our life, we look back and we might have a long list of accomplishments, we might have a resume, a stellar resume, where we can say, look, Jesus, look at everything I did. And yet we might never fulfill our true purpose. We might still look back at our life and think, wait a second, what was the point? What was the point? We have this long list of accomplishments, but what's the point? Our purpose is our relationship. Our purpose is about our relationship with God that has got to be front and center in everything we do. We have to continually remember that God's purpose has already been fulfilled and ours is to just receive that grace and that love. And then once we start to understand that that's our true purpose and our true calling, the rest of the actions and the things that we do on a daily basis will eventually fill in. But it's got to come through a filter and a lens of focusing on a relationship with him. To put this in another way, the second point is this, is that your purpose is more about who you are becoming than what you are doing. And again, as humans, we have this backwards. We think that, you know, the more that we do, the more successful we are, that that's what it's all about. But in reality, that's not the case. In reality, it's about who we are becoming. And who we are becoming should be more and more like Jesus every single day. Because the more that we become like Jesus, the more and the deeper that relationship is with our Father and the clearer our picture and our purpose comes alive in this life. Looking at Romans 8, 28 through 30, um, this is a familiar verse, but it talks specifically about our calling and our purpose as being who we are becoming and not what we are doing. So starting in verse 28, it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So you see here this word, this called, this idea of calling. And God says, no, I've called you already. Your purpose is to be in a relationship with me. And once you focus on that, I've got you. I'll take care of the rest. You don't have to worry about the day-to-day -day activities of what you're doing because, look, I've got you. I'm doing, making sure all those things are working together for your and my good. And then it continues, it says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. 
It's not about the do, it's about the who. It's about being conformed to the image of Jesus. And it's through that conforming that our relationship with God strengthens. And it's through that conforming of becoming more and more like Jesus on a daily basis where then it says we are justified. Then it says we are glorified. Then it becomes clear about the individual steps that we need to take along the way. And we learn those, but it first takes us focusing on our relationship and becoming more like Jesus every single day. Because church, at the end of the day, God wants our surrender more than he wants our success. God wants our surrender more than our success. Matthew 16 says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. God wants us to surrender our plans, to surrender the things that we don't understand and look to him. Look to him for strength and guidance. God wants our surrender more than our success. And so when we talk again about our calling and our purpose, we've already talked about how it's a relationship. It's not about our resume. It's about who we are becoming and less about what we are doing. But is that it? I mean, is that really all there is to it? Do we not have individual callings for our life or each and every one of us not set out to do incredible and unique and individual things? Well, no, we absolutely are called to do and have individual calls on our life. And we're called to walk in specific ways. But again, first we have to understand our greater purpose. And only then can we dig in a little deeper and figure out, okay, what do those steps look like along the way? And those steps have to do a lot with our gifts and our talents and our abilities. If we look at 1 Peter chapter 4, um, this talks about our idea of our gifts and our talents and how this fits into our broader purpose and calling in life. <clears throat> So starting in verse 10, it says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Each of us have unique gifts and talents and abilities. And while I don't think that that's any surprise, I think all of us are aware, whether we know exactly what each of our gifts and talents are, we know that we are created uniquely. We know that we each have something that makes us, you spe- makes us special and different. And while I could spend probably the rest of today and years exploring what each and every one of your gifts and your talents are and how you know, living out your calling looks like on a daily basis, I want to just talk broader. I want to talk about how our gifts and our talents fit into this broader purpose and calling for our life. And what I want you to walk away with today is understanding that your gifts and your calling should hold hands with the season that you are in. Your gifts and your calling should hold hands with the season that you are in. We all have individual, again, unique gifts and talents, but we're also all in different seasons of life. And just because the way that we express those gifts and talents in one season doesn't mean that that's how it has to be in all seasons of our life. So often I think that we get we find our talents, we find what we're good at, or we find what other people say that we're good at, and we feel handcuffed. We think, well, I have to do this. This has to be exactly how I have to live out my gifts and talents to make Jesus' name known in the world. And we feel handcuffed by our gifts and talents, and we end up getting bitter and frustrated because we go through different seasons and we can't see how those gifts and those talents fit into that season of life. We have to be willing to release those handcuffs. We have to be willing to adapt and change our gifts and talents based on the season of life that we are in. We have to look at our reality and say, you know what, here's where I am today. How can I be used right now, right where I am today, to fulfill God's mission and purpose in my life? Because different seasons call for different gifts and different ways to express them. 
You know, think about a fruit tree, for example, right? A fruit tree, its main purpose, its main calling in life is to what? It's to produce fruit, right? And yet we see that a fruit tree doesn't always produce fruit. We see that a fruit tree has different seasons that it goes through. And in the winter, when it gets prepared for winter, it drops its fruit, it drops its leaves, and it prepares for a season of rest. And it's only through that season of rest that that tree is then prepared to be fruitful again in the spring and in the summer. And so while its purpose, yes, is to produce fruit, it goes through different seasons. And so it is with our life. Sometimes we're called to fruitfulness, but sometimes we're also called to faithfulness in different seasons of our life. And if you want to explore this idea even more, Ecclesiastes is a beautiful book talking all about how there's a purpose and a reason for every season under the sun and how we need to embrace each and every season that we find ourselves in. We have to be willing to adjust how we express our talents and our gifts based on where we are in our current reality. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 17 says this, Nevertheless, each person should live believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. No matter where we are, we are called to be believers. And it doesn't matter. Where we are looks different for each and every person. But we are called in whatever situation that the Lord assigns us to be faithful and to understand our true purpose, which is a relationship with him, becoming more and more like Jesus, and to make his name known. To put this another way or to kind of take this concept a little bit deeper, your message always stays the same, but your mission field may change. God calls us to go into the world and preach the gospel to all all creation. That right there is our message. Our message will never change. It's to love God and love others, to serve God and to serve others. Think about it like, how many teachers do we have here? So if you're online, say, you know, raise your hand, say I'm a teacher. First of all, let's just take a moment to thank teachers for what they do. I mean, what you guys do on a daily basis is absolutely incredible. But teachers, you understand this idea of how your message might be the same, but your mission field might change. Because say you're a third grade teacher. You know, every year the third grade curriculum stays pretty much the same. And yet, every year you have a new set of students that come in through your doors. And within that new set of students, you have individual personalities. And so the way that you express that curriculum to those students has to look different year by year. And not only year by year, but day by day and student by student. The message stays the same, but your mission field and how you express that changes. Or or think about it this way, if you travel to a foreign country where they don't speak your native language, so that they don't speak English whatsoever, if you want to communicate with them, you can't expect to just talk in English normally and use what we're used to here in America to communicate. You have to learn about their culture. You have to speak in their language. If you want to know where the bathroom is in France, you can't ask them in Chinese. Right? You have to know where you are and change how you deliver your message, even if it's the same. Our season determines how our gifts and our talents and our abilities are expressed. And that's why I can't just stand up here and give you a formula for what exactly each and every one of your talents and your gifts and your abilities are, because it changes depending on the person. It changes depending on the season that you are in. You have to first look at your reality and where you are today and ask yourself, God, how can I use my gifts, my talents, and my abilities to fit into your grand purpose? Maybe for you, you are in a season where you are the provider for your family. You are in the workforce, and that is where you are called right now. And while maybe you have a heart that wants to be a missionary and you want to go to third world countries and get the name of Jesus known to those third world countries, right now in your season, you are called to be the financial provider for your family. And so your, your time doesn't allow for that. But that doesn't mean you can't use your gifts and your ambitions to make a difference now. 
You can have a scholarship to send someone who does have the ability to go travel and who does have that ability in their season in their life right now to go do that. Maybe right now your season of life, you are a stay-at-home mom or dad. And while you have desires and ambitions and you can't wait till they go out of the house and so you can do your own things and fulfill your own dreams and passions, right now today, your calling is to be that supporter and that provider. And so you have to look at the reality that you are in and then ask yourself, okay, how can my gifts and my talents play into this? And another part of this too that we have to look at is just like that fruit tree, sometimes our seasons of life are rest. And sometimes with that rest, you know, we have to be willing to say, I'm okay with being where I am right now. And while I want things to get better and I want things to go back to normal, right now I'm in a season of rest. So God, how can I right now in my season of rest honor you and worship you? to take this again one step further. You know, sometimes our missions and our reality that God calls us to, we have grand missions and we're called to make large impacts among lots of different people. But sometimes in our life, our mission, sometimes our calling may be more about depth than breadth. Sometimes where we are, God calls us to go deeper instead of wider. And again, as humans, as Americans especially, we think bigger is better, right? We think the more money we have, the more successful we are, the greater impact we can have. And of course, that's what God wants, is for us to have the widest impact possible. But yet, that's not what God tells us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 through 29, it says this, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. He's like, look, guys, we all find ourselves in the same boat. None of us really come from money. None of us come from influence. But the good thing about all of this is that it doesn't matter. Because he goes on to say, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world, the despised things, and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so no one may boast before him. Jesus came to flip our ideology completely upside down. We think that bigger is better. We think that the bigger the stage we stand on, the more impact we have, but that is not true. God is saying, no, I can make just as much of an impact if you go deep than if you go wide. Sometimes, church, our calling is a, maybe more about depth than breadth. When I was growing up, my parents put me in swimming lessons, and obviously very grateful for them for doing that because I, I am a pretty good swimmer. Um, but I do have to say that I hated swimming lessons. I guess I should clarify. I didn't necessarily hate all of swimming lessons. I hated level six of swimming lessons. <laughs> and I hated level six because if you're familiar with swimming lessons, you know you have certain skills or proficiencies that you have to pass in order to go on to the next level. Well, in level six, uh, there was two really big things that you had to prove to the teachers that you could do. And one of those things was your strokes. So you had to show that you could swim from one end of the pool to the other end in different strokes, different speeds, et cetera. And you know, that part of swimming lessons didn't bug me. I was pretty good at that. I could beat most of the boys in my class. I was really quick. I knew all the strokes. I could get from one end of the pool to the other super quick. But the part that I absolutely hated was the second part, that in order to pass level six, you also had to go to the deep end of the pool and retrieve a brick from the deepest part of the pool. You had to go and retrieve a five pound brick and at the pool that we were at, the deepest part was 13 feet. And for some reason that absolutely terrified me. And so, because I'm smart, my sister, I have a twin sister, uh, we were always in the same class together. And you know, you could practice these skills before uh, you actually had to give it to their, show your teachers that you could do it. And so what we would do, you know, we'd line up along the wall, and then you'd go, get, one student would go get the brick, bring it back up, throw it back out for the next student to go get it, bring it up, and throw it back out. Well, I had my sister always go first. So you know how in a pool, like oftentimes the sides are sloped, and so it doesn't actually reach the deepest point until right in the middle? 
Well, I would always make sure that my sister would go before me and she'd go get the brick, bring it up, and then she'd throw it so it would land on that slope. <laughs> so instead of actually having to go 13 feet, I'd really only have to go like 9 or 10. Well, as you can imagine, when it came time for testing day, I wasn't prepared. And it took forever. I eventually ended up passing level 6, but I clearly have some emotional scars from that because it was tough and it was challenging because I wasn't prepared to go the full depth, to go the full 13 feet to get that brick. And I think how this relates to our life and how so often we're so focused on how fast we can swim, we're so focused on getting from one end of the pool to the other, and we're just so focused on trying to do it in all these fancy ways, and what ends up happening is that we only end up skimming the surface and we completely miss the brick at the other end of the pool. We lose sight of the opportunities that we have to go deep. We get so focused on our careers and getting ahead that we miss the opportunity to minister to that employee that just needed a hug. We get so focused on our to-do list and getting the dishes and the laundry done that we miss the opportunity to give our kids the attention even when they've asked us to watch their flip for the 40th time. We miss the opportunity to smile at the cashier that just needed that one reason to not go home and end it all. Sometimes our calling isn't about how wide and how fast we can go, but it's about how deep we can go. So church, I want to ask you today, what is one area where you can lean in more deeply? If you were part of our youth group every Wednesday, um, I give my students what's called Chelsea's Challenge. And Chelsea's Challenge is uh, a, basically a way for them to put feet on their faith, a way for them to kind of put practicality behind the lessons that we're learning. And so church, I'm gonna give you the same Chelsea's challenge that I gave my students this week. And it's this, what's one area of your life where you can lean in more deeply? Given the season of life that you are in, given your gifts and your talents, where today can you lean in more deeply? Maybe that's your relationship with God. Maybe you've never even considered a relationship with him. Maybe just this week, despite all the questions and the fears and what everyone said, maybe just this week you lean in a little bit deeper into that relationship. Maybe this week it's your family, your marriage, or your kids. What area of your life can you lean in more deeply? And remember, church, that our purpose is about a relationship with him. It's about becoming more and more like Jesus every single day. But we have to be willing to adjust what that looks like depending on the season of life we're in. We have to be honest with what our reality and where we're at. And church, we have to understand that God can have just as much of an impact on our life by going deep than he can by going wide. And so before uh, we close, I do want to bring up one other thing. And there's a reason why this message is what it is this morning. Uh, and there's a reason why I am up here giving the message and why it's not Pastor Ryan. As many of you know, uh, we have a four-and-a-half-year-old at home, and then we also have a baby on the way due in September. And so come September, our family is going to be entering a different season of life. And with that season of life comes just different opportunities and with those different opportunities, we have different ways to be able to express my gifts and my calling in new ways and make an impact. And so church, this is my formal announcement, I guess you could say, that come August, um, I will be stepping down as the youth director here at Central. But I want you to hear loud and clear that I'm not going anywhere, we're not going anywhere that our family, you guys are our family, and you mean so much to us, and that will not change. We still wanna be a part of your lives, we're still gonna volunteer, we're gonna be a part of the growth of this church and all the amazing things that, you, that we're gonna be able to do. But for right now, in this season of my life, I have the incredible opportunity to take my own challenge and to lean in more deeply, to, to fulfill my calling as a mother to fulfill my calling as a supporter of my family. 
And so I know Pastor Ryan, I think, is going to come up and just kind of close us off and say a few things. But again, church, I just want you to know that I'm not going anywhere. I'm still here. I'm still a part of your life. Um, and that while it might not be in a formal role as a youth director, it's just going to look a little different. But I fully trust and believe in God that I'm going to have just as much of an impact going deeper into my role as a mother and in my family than I have had in this past year as a youth director. So we talk all the time here about next steps. Um, Christianity is simply a series of next steps. And um, our next steps are never easy for us, um, and they're seldom easy for the people around us. And so I know this is an incredibly difficult thing um, for us to hear. A year ago, um, Chelsea stepped into a role um, that we desperately needed to fill. And she's done an incredible job, um, and she's brought our youth ministry um, to levels that we didn't even know um, could happen, because that's how God works. God works in ways that we could, um, in bigger ways than we could ever ask or imagine, and, and she has been absolutely incredible. She's been an absolute rock star in helping us get to where we need to be and where God wanted us to go in our 712 youth ministry. And so while she's stepping away from that, and she's stepping into her next steps, um, she still is going to be an incredibly um, big part of what we're doing moving forward. Um, she's an incredible communicator. You would all agree to that, right? She's, she's great being up here. Um, and so she's still going to be a part of my teaching team. Um, and so she'll still be within the rotation um, of times when, when I'm not going to be here. And so I'm excited to be able to do that. Um, we're also excited to be able to help Chelsea find other opportunities uh, to speak and to go out into other places and to share the message um, that God has placed in her heart and, and the ways in life um, the life opportunities that God has given her to go out and, and to share. And so we're excited to be able to partner with her with that and for her to still be a part um, of what God is doing here um, in Central, not just in Carroll and the surrounding communities, but down in Creston and in other places as well as we continue to, to seek God's will and God's direction for our church. And so, Chelsea, we're incredibly grateful for everything that you've done. And I know we've got 10 weeks or whatever left, so um, that's cool, and we're going to enjoy that, and we're going to make you work really, really extra hard now <laughs> because of that. Just just kidding. Um, but but just remember, church, that this is, this is a good thing. Um, we look at things, and we look at transition, and we look at change often um, as bad and, and hard, and, and yes, it is hard, and, and yes, there are, there are difficulties, and, and there are all those things that, that come with change, but as God is calling us into our next steps. He's, he's molding us and, and he's drawing us um, closer to, to him than, than, than we've ever been. And so we, we should never, ever, ever be satisfied with where we are. We should always be seeking God. We should always be asking God, hey God, what's next? God, what's next? God, what's next? God, what's next? I want to grow. I want to grow. I want to grow. Um, I'm constantly asking God, what are my next steps? Now, my next steps um, aren't, aren't leaving or anything like that, um, but my next steps are, 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 are these personal growth things, and a lot of times they're within my family um, or they're within this church, but they're, they're always things that draw me closer to God. And so we're excited for Chelsea, and we're excited for Cole um, and Kale and this new baby when he comes, knowing that she's going to be an incredible mom and she's going to be able to, to do all of the things that she needs to do um, for and with her family, um, but that she's still going to be here, and she's still going to be um, a big part of, of what we do here, just not um, on a, necessarily on a, on a staff role. Um, she does know that at any time ever that she needs a church job, she is always welcome um, back on the staff here at Central Church. And so we're incredibly, incredibly grateful for Chelsea. Um, so online, if you want to just send some messages of gratitude to Chelsea, um, we would greatly appreciate that, and I'm sure she would love to, to hear about that. But let's continue to support Chelsea. Let's continue to support Central Church and, and everything that God is doing here. Amen? All right, let's let Chelsea close out in prayer. God, thank you for the gift of another, another day. Thank you for the gift of another message. Thank you for who you are and for your purpose, which is reconciling us to you through your son, Jesus. 
And God, we are just so incredibly grateful that you call each and every one of us deeper into our next steps. And Lord, I just ask today that you speak to those that want to hear what your next step is for their life. And God, that you work through them and you help them to see clearly what their purpose is right now in their season of life. God, we are so grateful for you and we are so just blessed and we just pray over everyone here watching online that they have an incredibly blessed week and that you just watch over them and help them to become more and more like your son every day. In your name we pray, amen.